All right, so the special theory was published in 1905. Roughly about 10 years later, he came up with the general theory of relativity. Special theory was a specialized case of, case of motion, right? So uh, it was only true near the light speed. So motions near the light speed at constant velocity was the specialized case of motion. So you're moving at a straight line at a constant speed and you're moving near the light speed. So what happens under the circumstances? If you're looking outside, the space is gonna contract in the direction of motion. Within your own reference frame, the time is gonna slow down, but you're not gonna notice it, but we will notice it for you because your time is gonna slow down relative to us. And then we're not gonna make you go at the light speed. This is what happens to the energy that we put into your system so that you can go at the light speed is gonna go into your mass instead of your speed, that's it. Uh, that's the general, that's the special theory of relativity. It's a specialized case of motion. Now the general theory of relativity is a generalized case of motion, including the accelerated reference frame, like gravity. It's, it's, it's meant to explain what gravity is in us. And it's not speed dependent. It's not direction dependent. It's a generalized theory of relativity. And this was a lot more complicated than the special theory of relativity. And out of that, we have the concept of time travel. All right, so three conditions need to be satisfied for time travel to be possible. Number one, time needs to be a continuum. All right, you, can, you cannot travel to a time that doesn't exist. You cannot travel to a place that doesn't exist. You cannot travel to a time that doesn't exist. You wanna to go to the future, the future has to exist and it needs to be just as real as the present. You wanna to go to the past, the past needs to exist and just as, needs to be just as real as the present. That's what it means. So time needs to be a continuum, meaning that the past, the present, the future all need to exist at the same time and they need to be just as real as the present is. That's what it means. The second condition that needs to be satisfied is the space-time continuum needs to occur, so we can take shortcuts, like through normal. If it's flat, forget it. And the third condition that needs to be satisfied is the act of time travel needs to create its own parallel history. And we need this condition, we need it very desperate. Or else traveling back to the past would only create paradoxes. Nature would not allow paradoxes. All right, so all these three conditions need to be satisfied. So we will check, we will get to investigate whether or not these conditions are satisfied. Time needs to be a continuum. And according to Einstein's theory of gravity, the one that we're about to jump into says that the time is a continuum. That becomes the premise of the theory. All right, so the question is, is this just theory or is this a scientific path? If it's a theory, you could just make an argument. You can go blah, blah, blah forever. I'm sure somebody's gonna find your blabbering interesting, except you don't blabber in sciences. All right, so the question is, is time a continuum? We'll find out. So everything hinges on the question of what is gravity? All right, we almost thought for whatever reason that we had an answer for that question because we did spend a little bit over a week talking about gravity. In fact, we spent quite a few weeks talking about gravity and physics. So what is gravity? All right, so this is Einstein's general theory of relativity, otherwise known as the general relativity. This is all about motion accelerate, regarding accelerated reference frame. Okay, so speaking of acceleration, what do we know? Acceleration is change in velocity. The velocity is a combination of speed and direction. So this, Theory includes speeding up, slowing down, changing direction, sitting in front of the TV, watching TV. If that's what you want to do, driving up or tapping, it makes no difference. This is life, which means that this theory is inclusive of everything that you will experience within your own lifetime. And if you want to be really abstract, this is going to include everything from the beginning of the universe. We're talking about Big, big Bang all the way to the end of it, if there's such a thing. All right, so this is a big theory. This is one of the biggest theories in physics. So, and everything hinges on that question. What is gravity? Oh, according to Newton, gravity is this formula. This formula is what describes gravity in essence. According to Newton, gravity is a force. How do we know? Because Newton has a definition of a force. All right, so force is what causes acceleration. If something is accelerating, a force acting on the mass is going to cause it to accelerate. That's it. Falling objects accelerate, which means that they accelerate because of the force acting on it. And the following objects will accelerate at a constant rate under the influence of a force, which we refer to as gravity. So which means that gravity is a force. That's what it is. And this formula tells you why all objects fall at the same rate. According to this formula, this is the rate at which the following objects fall or accelerate. It depends on the mass of the planet. And it's gonna be inversely related to the square of the size of the planet. That's it. Mass of the falling object doesn't matter because it does not make it to the final formula. So here, here is the final formula. According to Newton, gravity is a force. According to Newton, gravity is a force. Objects will fall at a constant rate because how fast they fall, how fast they will accelerate depends on the mass of the planet. And it's gonna be inversely proportional to the square of the size of the planet. Fine. All right. If you are perfectly satisfied with everything which is expressed in the form of math, then you're fine. 
except this doesn't really answer the question as to why objects fall at sin. All right, it doesn't provide any sort of explanation. This is just an equation. It's to say, hey, listen, uh, boom, 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 do the math, and then all objects will fall at sin, right? Because it depends on the mass of the planet. It's going to be versus the square of the size of the planet. So, so what? It doesn't explain how it's related to mass. It doesn't explain how it's related to the size of a planet. You have a question, and that question is not answered. You cannot answer the question by using the Newton's law. Natural philosophers of Europe, natural philosophers are physicists. They didn't call themselves physicists at the time. They used to call themselves natural philosophers. They were very impressed with Newton as a mathematician, not as a physicist. They looked at him. They scoffed, scoffed at the idea that Newton thought he knew something. They said, wait a minute. So how does the gravity extend all the way out to the moon again? They said, oh, question. If it's a force, how does it extend all the way out to the moon? Moon is like a quarter of a million miles away. How does the force of gravity extend all the way out to the moon and beyond without any physical contact between the Earth and the moon? It's a valid question. How so? It is a valid question, and here's the reason why. If I want to actually accelerate something, I need to exert a force on it. Notice that this thing, this thing moves on the direction of the force. So I push on it, it's going to accelerate on the direction of the push. I pull on it, it's going to move on the direction of the pull. And the only way I'm going to be able to transfer the force is by touching it. There's a physical contact between my hand and this glass. If I'm not touching it, just by going through the motions, by pushing on it or pulling on it without touching it, notice that the force does not get transferred. So the question is, wait a minute, they said, how does this force extend all the way out to the moon without any physical contact between the Earth and the moon again? Because the main requirement for transferring a force is Objects need to be in contact with each other, literally, physically. No physical contact, no transfer, and so forth. Newton, being a genius that he was, he came up with the best explanation. When asked, how does the force of gravity extend all the way out to the moon without any physical contact between the Earth and the moon? He said, I have no idea. Furthermore, he said, I think no hypothesis. He didn't even have a theory. The guy didn't even have a theory. The only thing he said, I know, is Gravity simply extends all the way out to the moon. And the proof is this equation. That's it. Because this equation generates a number, makes a prediction, which agrees with the measured number. Experimental, as well as the theoretical numbers match. That's it. Which means that this formula is correct in the way it describes gravity. This formula only describes gravity. It does not explain the inner workings of gravity. All right, as far as this formula is concerned, gravity is a force. As far as this formula is concerned, gravity extends all the way out to the moon because the moon, instead of going in a straight line at a constant speed, that moon would have in the absence of an external force. It orbits the Earth. It deviates from a straight line onto a trajectory 1 20th of an inch per second. It deviates from a straight line 1 20th of an inch per second onto a trajectory that matches the curvature of the surface of the Earth. Once again, the theoretical numbers match the observed numbers. Ob observed numbers match the theoretical predictions. That's the proof that gravity extends all the way out to the moon. So Newton's explanation is it simply does. I don't have an explanation as to how the force of gravity extends all the way out to the moon, but it simply does because the numbers match, experimental and theoretical numbers match. That's it. This is known as action at a distance. He said, I'm gonna leave it out to the future generations to figure out how that's possible. And then next generation of physicists came up with the force field idea. All right, so the gravitational force extends all the way out to the moon and beyond. It's a force field. So the question becomes how fast? According to Newton's theory, this force extends all the way out to the moon and beyond instantaneously. It's an instantaneous force. So if it's an instantaneous force, how long does it take for this force to get to the moon? It takes no time at all. How long would it take for this force to reach a planet 800 light years away? It takes no time at all. How long would it take to reach the edges of the universe? It takes no time at all. It's an instantaneous force. That's what it means. Well, if you're Einstein, you got a problem with it because Einstein had a fetish. His fetish is this special theory of relativity, according to which he says nothing, nothing, Nothing can travel at the light speed or faster. Nothing outside of light can travel at the light speed and nothing can travel faster than light. Not even gravity. As far as he's concerned, something is lacking in Newton's theory. 
And now this becomes his next obsession, the gravity. And long before Einstein, the quest for unification began with the most famous accident in the history of science. As the story goes, one day in 1665, a young man was sitting under a tree when all of a sudden he saw an apple fall from above. And with the fall of that apple, Isaac Newton revolutionized our picture of the universe. In an audacious proposal for his time, Newton proclaimed that the force pulling apples to the ground and the force keeping the moon in orbit around the Earth were actually one and the same. In one fell swoop, Newton unified the heavens and the Earth in a single theory he called gravity. The unification of the celestial with the terrestrial, that the same laws that govern the planets in their motions govern the tides and the falling of fruit here on Earth. Uh, it was a fantastic unification of our picture of nature. Gravity was the first force to be understood scientifically, though three more would eventually follow. And although Newton discovered his law of gravity more than 300 years ago, his equations describing this force make such accurate predictions that we still make use of them today. In fact, scientists needed nothing more than Newton's equations to plot the course of a rocket that landed men on the moon. Yet, there was a problem. While his laws described the strength of gravity with great accuracy, Newton was harboring an embarrassing secret. He had no idea how gravity actually works. All right, so according to Newton, this is what gravity is. And they said this contains both. For nearly 250 years, scientists were content to look the other way when confronted with this mystery. But in the early 1900s, an unknown clerk working in the Swiss patent office would change all that. While reviewing patent applications, Albert Einstein was also pondering the behavior of light. And little did Einstein know that his musings on light would lead him to solve Newton's mystery of what gravity is. At the age of 26, Einstein made a startling discovery. That the velocity of light is a kind of cosmic speed limit, a speed that nothing in the universe can exceed. But no sooner had the young Einstein published this idea than he found himself squaring off with the father of gravity. The trouble was, the idea that nothing can go faster than the speed of light flew in the face of Newton's picture of gravity. To understand this conflict, we have to run a few experiments. And to begin with, let's create a cosmic catastrophe. Imagine that all of a sudden, and without any warning, the sun vaporizes and completely disappears. Now, let's replay that catastrophe and see what effect it would have on the planets according to Newton. Newton's theory predicts that with the destruction of the sun, the planets would immediately fly out of their orbits, careening off into space. In other words, Newton thought that gravity was a force that acts instantaneously across any distance. Mm -hmm. And so we would immediately feel the effect of the sun's destruction. But Einstein saw a big problem with Newton's theory. A problem that arose from his work with light. Einstein knew light doesn't travel instantaneously. In fact, it takes eight minutes for the sun's rays to travel the 93 million miles to the Earth. And since he had shown that nothing, not even gravity, can travel faster than light, how could the Earth be released from orbit before the darkness resulting from the sun's disappearance reached our eyes? To the young upstart from the Swiss patent office, anything outrunning light was impossible. And that meant the 250-year-old Newtonian picture of gravity was wrong. If Newton is wrong, then why do the planets stay up? Because remember, the triumph of Newton's equations come from the quest to understand the planets and the stars. In particular, the problem of why do the planets have the orbits that they go. And with Newton's equations, you can calculate the way that the planets will move. Einstein's got to resolve this dilemma. In his late 20s, Einstein had to come up with a new picture of the universe in which gravity does not exceed the cosmic speed limit. Still working his day job in the patent office, Einstein embarked on a solitary quest to solve this mystery. After nearly 10 years of racking his brain, he found the answer in a new kind of unification. Einstein came to think of the three dimensions of space and the single dimension of time as bound together in a single fabric of space-time. It 
was his hope that by understanding the geometry of this four-dimensional fabric of space-time, that he could simply talk about things moving along surfaces in this space-time fabric. Like the surface of a trampoline, this unified fabric is warped and stretched by heavy objects like planets and stars. And it's this warping or curving of space-time that creates what we feel as gravity. A planet like the Earth is kept in orbit not because the sun reaches out and instantaneously grabs hold of it, as in Newton's theory, but simply because it follows curves in the spatial fabric caused by the sun's presence. So, with this new understanding of gravity, let's rerun the cosmic catastrophe. Let's see what happens now if the sun disappears. The gravitational disturbance that results will form a wave that travels across the spatial fabric in much the same way that a pebble dropped into a pond makes ripples that travel across the surface of the water. So we wouldn't feel a change in our orbit around the sun until this wave reached the Earth. What's more, Einstein calculated that these ripples of gravity travel at exactly the speed of light. And so with this new approach, Einstein resolved the conflict with Newton over how fast gravity travels. And more than that, Einstein gave the world a new picture for what the force of gravity actually is. It's warps and curves in the fabric of space and time. Einstein called this new picture of gravity general relativity. And within a few short years, Albert Einstein became a household name. Einstein was like a rock star in his day. He was one of the most widely known and recognizable figures alive. He and perhaps Charlie Chaplin were the reigning kings of the popular media. Albert Einstein, among other things, revolutionized the way we think about good old gravity. Astronomers generally only talk about one force, and that's gravity. And the reason for it is almost everything that's important on the large scale, that is on the scale of planets and stars or the universe as a whole, is gravity. From Einstein, we know that the gravity that pulled Newton's apple down from the tree isn't a kind of magnetism. Gravity is a property of matter and space. Matter bends space. The more mass, the more space around the mass is warped. That's why the moon goes around the Earth. It's trapped in a dimple in space, a gravity pit created by the mass of the Earth. When enough matter collects, gravity... Uh, so what's gravity according to Einstein? All right, so gravity, according to Einstein, is not a force. It's not a force. It's just the curvature of the space-time continuum. This is what we experience as gravity. What curves, what warps the space-time continuum is the mass itself. Energy or mass is going to warp the space-time continuum. And if the space-time continuum, if it's warped, if it's not flat, we will experience that as gravity. How do you come up with a theory like that? This is so weird. I mean, how, do you, how do you solve a problem like that? All right, so space-time continuum, if it's flat, there's no gravity. If you warp it, this warpage that you're looking at, this curvature that you're looking at is what you experience as gravity. So what warps it is mass. Mass is a form of energy, so energy is what warps the space-time continuum. When I say space-time continuum, which means that time is a continuum in this theory. Space and time merged together is going to give you the space-time continuum. So the one thought is, wait a minute, this is visual, it looks nice, we all kind of get it, but... How do you prove a theory like that? Forget that. How do you even come up with a theory like that? How, how do you even start solving the problem? Like that? A lot of you guys are mistaken to thinking that the physics is done in the form of math. And I kind of see it in the solutions here because I'm grading right now. The only thing I'm seeing, I'm seeing is you guys draw a bunch of equations without explaining it. I got news for you guys. You express the idea in the form of math, but the physics is not math at all. All right, the psychology, you express ideas in psychology using English or Chinese or Japanese. It's not English, it's not Japanese, it's not Chinese. Those are the languages of communication. The math is just a language of communication. You're thinking, oh, you just start with one equation and then substitute into a different equation, a different equation, and boom, you got the theory of relativity. Absolutely not. That's not how things done. Physics is done exactly the same way that Faraday had done. It. Remember Faraday, you couldn't do math and he used to think about things in his head? Physics is very conceptual, except the difference between Faraday and us we can express those ideas in the form of math. Faraday needed Maxwell to express his ideas, but the concepts were still conceptual. How do you start a problem like this? Number one, just look at the moon when it's nice outside. Full moon, just check to see if you can see the curvature of space time continuum. No, you won't be able to see anything, right? Unless you're high on something illegal. Because there's nothing to see. This is a three-dimensional representation of four-dimensional space time continuum. Now, for you to be able to see this, you need to be on the next dimension, the fifth dimension. The reason why you don't see that because we experience the time only in the present. We only see the three dimensions. 
all right? Everything around us within the second. The fourth dimension, we just experience it in the present. We don't see the future, we don't see the past. Despite the fact, according to this theory, the past, the future, the present, all happen at the same time. And we would know that if we could just somehow magically pull ourselves to the next dimension. And when you do that, now you can see the fourth dimension, the time dimension in its entirety from the beginning of the universe to the end of it. You can see the entire history of the universe. If the future doesn't exist, no gravity. If the past doesn't exist, no gravity. That's what it means. So how does one solve a problem like this? Becomes the question. You cannot do math. You have to have a starting point. How do you begin to solve a problem like this? Gravity is the most democratic phenomenon in the universe. It treats every object the same, no matter what it is made of, no matter how big it is. There were no exceptions to give Einstein a place to start. He had no idea how to approach the problem, until... Then all of a sudden, uh, it occurred to me. The glücklichste Gedanke meines Lebens, the happiest thought of my life. If a man falls from the roof of a house, he will not feel his own weight. But the spring of 19... And then the theory was put to test. 1919 was special, even for him. A silent film explained Einstein's breakthrough to the public, with animation by Max Fleischer, creator of Betty Boop. General Relativity predicted that starlight passing close to the sun would curve around the warp in space-time created by the sun's mass. That bending of the light would make the stars seem to occupy a new position in the sky to an observer on Earth. This could only be seen during a total eclipse of the sun. A British expedition traveled to the South Atlantic in 1919 to photograph an eclipse. It would be the first public test of Einstein's theory. May 29th dawned overcast over the Atlantic. But then the sky cleared. And in the shadow of the eclipse, light warped around the sun. Gravity bends light exactly as Einstein had predicted. What would I have thought if the English had found nothing? I said at the time, I would feel sorry for the dear Lord. The theory is correct. For me, general relativity was simply too beautiful to be false. It was inconceivable that the English would come back proving me wrong. The eclipse results were announced in November. Literally overnight, Einstein became world famous, the first scientist celebrity of the 20th century. Special even for him. A silent film explained Einstein's breakthrough to the public with animation by Max Fleck. All right, so the first proof of the accuracy of the Einstein's theory of gravity happened during the solar eclipse of 1919. Yeah, let's just talk about how the theory was proven. So be, take a look at one single, so here's the sun, here's the uh, Earth, and here's a star which is kind of partially hidden by the sun. So what's happening is the light following the curvatures of space-time continuum, it just warps around the sun. It just bends around the sun. Remember, the sun is extremely massive, so it warps the space-time continuum. As a result, the light just following the curvatures of the space-time continuum, which is going to bend around the sun. And then we have a tendency to see things in a straight line. So this is known as a gravitational lensing. Uh, so we end up seeing the star at a different location. So the star is going to appear at a location predicted by the theory. All right, so the theory makes a prediction as to where these partially hidden stars will appear. It's going to make precise predictions as to where these stars are going to appear. All right, so except there's a slight problem. The problem is the problem here. two people taking pictures and measurements. All right, the guy on the left, Addington, the guy on the right, Campbell. All right, so Addington is British, the Campbell is from the United States. So uh, they have contradictory results of the measurements that they took. Addington says Einstein's theory is proven. Campbell says, not so much, not so fast, he says. As far as Campbell is concerned, uh, they, there's no difference. It doesn't seem like the sun makes any difference in terms of the apparent location of these stars. All right, so all of a sudden there's a huge uproar in Europe and because the scientific community decided to go along with Addington. In the United States, there's people are skeptics. They are skeptical as to whether or not Addington is lying. So the question is, why would he lie? And obviously they think that there's, there's a, some kind of a political decision there, or right? some kind of a political calculation there. Addington was a pacifist, he's British, obviously. And so, so was Einstein. And they felt, most people felt that Eddington was trying to promote Einstein into this international prominence because, you know, he was a voice of reason. They thought that this guy had a secondary motive. In fear, in turn, he had a secondary motive in essence. And so they thought that Campbell didn't have any investment in this research. And they figured that the Campbell's 
observations would be accurate in that sense. And Einstein's theory would not be proven. As a result, the Nobel Committee decided to just say, okay, well, you know, the theory itself didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of physicists. I mean, what's the meaning of space and time, time merging into a continuum? And then when you warp it, you end up getting gravity. What's the implication of it? The implication of it is the future, the past, the present. I'll need to happen at the same time. So that's bizarre. It's nonsensical. Forget about me just trashing your common sense. All right, this is worse than common sense. This is nonsense. But common sense is pretty bad, but nonsense is worse than common sense. I mean, this theory literally assumes that the future, the past, the present all need to happen at the same time. And all of a sudden, there's a dispute. The dispute is, they, the, this observation is unresolved. So what do we do? What's the next step? The next step is just wait for the next eclipse, 1922 eclipse. And this time, everybody was ready. Right? Everybody knew about the dispute and everybody was ready. And they decided that they were gonna resolve this issue once and for all. Some people wonder, how did Einstein think? How do we physicists think? Most of it is when we're- Because he's in front of all of his colleagues. Already feel what happened. A backlash set in. In the New York Times, you can see that they were constantly, constantly questioning, who is this famous scientist? Most the British people and most Americans, most people from the Allied powers were very hostile to Germany after the war. They were not at all interested in reconciliation. So many people were saying, oh, Eddington was so motivated by the goal of peace and promoting international brotherhood. He was so convinced by the theory that perhaps uh, he allowed himself to be a little bit biased. He's been criticized for fudging the figures. The photographic results from the two solar eclipse expeditions, Eddington's and Campbell's, result in a split decision. Another expedition will need to be mounted. Both Einstein, who has been trying to prove his theory since he first proposed it in 1907, and Campbell, who has been working on the problem since 1911, have tremendous personal stakes in results. Now it was a matter of not just science, it was a matter of international reputation, it was a matter of personal reputation. This was personal. Campbell checks the charts and sees that the next best eclipse to photograph will be in Australia in 1922, more than two years from now. And it turns out, he will not be the only one to take up the challenge. It's 1921, and the 42-year-old Albert Einstein becomes science's first superstar. Einstein has this sort of victory tour uh, of the world. In America, newspapers are reporting as the boat goes across the Atlantic. Einstein is coming. There are 15,000 people waiting to meet Einstein in Lower Manhattan. This is for a theoretical physicist. He traveled all up and down the East Coast through the Midwest. Einstein is a total phenomenon. But more importantly for Einstein, the scientific community is still debating whether his theory is correct. And the more attention Einstein gets, the more his theory is thrown into doubt. Einstein is being exposed to increasing criticism of his theory of relativity. People said we have to redo the test. In September of 1922, a total solar eclipse will be fully visible in Australia, and William Wallace Campbell sees an opportunity to set things right once and for all. He started making plans to completely redo his equipment, completely redesigned, redesigned entirely with this measurement in mind. This was the Cadillac of Einstein effect measuring equipment. The first eclipse point was the very, very, very westernmost part of Australia, in a place called 90 Mile Beach. But this time, Campbell is not the only one pursuing this goal. Seven, count them, seven expeditions went to Australia. The British sent an expedition. Freundlich led an expedition. It was the first time he had a chance since Russia. John Evershed, a British astronomer, was able to come from India. The Canadian sent an expedition. In two Australian expeditions went. Serious competition to Campbell. The British and Freundlich got clouded out. One of the Australians couldn't get any data. Their equipment was lousy. Poor Evershed from India had beautiful clear skies, but he had technical difficulties, so he got nothing. Campbell, now in his third expedition, is much better prepared. He gets perfect results. And they showed, I think, 92 stars that the Einstein effect was not only there, but it behaved as Einstein predicted, very clearly, very unambiguously. This is one of the lenses which confirmed the theory of relativity. Uh, the light actually passed through this lens and actually fell on this plate. This stuff is, is way cool. I mean, this is, this is the heart. The stars could be seen around the eclipsed sun. Here, highlighted, showed just the deflection predicted by relativity. They nailed it. Einstein was so right. It is a proud personal achievement for Campbell and a landmark moment for science. The Lick party finally succeeds, gets extraordinarily good results, and resoundingly corroborates Edison's 1919 measurements. Now, who was the first person that Campbell sent a cable to with the result? Albert Einstein. He wanted Einstein to know, boy, did we vindicate you. Boy, did we show that Eddington was right, despite what all the scoffers are saying. For Einstein, this was a tremendous triumph. The Eclipse Expedition gives us amazing proof of something that looks theoretical, and yet it's very much part of our lives. They show that space-time around the sun was curving. There's a whole new way of thinking about how gravity works. How strange is that? That's completely against our intuition. 
but it's what the data showed. And you cannot argue with the data. Nature agrees. Yes, Einstein, that's a beautiful theory. You're right. Finally, 15 years after he first proposed his radical general theory of relativity, upending more than two centuries of scientific thought, Einstein is victorious and vindicated. Almost. The Nobel Committee rejected him in 1919 and in 1920 and in 1921 because no one accepted the theory of relativity. Einstein had promised the money from the prize as part of his divorce from Aleva and his support for his two sons. Aleva has resigned to the divorce, living with the boys in Zurich, waiting for the money from the Nobel Prize to come away. She's actually relying on it. You know, it's not until 1922 that they finally announce his Nobel Prize. And one of the ironies, he never gets it for the theory of relativity. Instead, Einstein receives it for the first of his miracle year papers, which describes the photoelectric effect. This work becomes the foundation for quantum mechanics and unlocks the secrets of the atom. All right, so that's the... And we will jump into the quantum theory. He will win the Nobel Prize for studying the quantum theory. All right, so... Evidently, Arthur Eddington did not budge his results. Okay, so the, the 1922 results prove Eddington's results from 1919. And Campbell is the one who actually, he's the only one who was able to get good measurements. And he was able to prove Einstein right. And then he was also able to verify Cam the Eddington's results. And then something weird happened. This guy had a stroke, the portion of the brain responsible for communication ended up getting completely destroyed. All right, and then uh, he couldn't communicate under the circumstances. He didn't want to be a burden to his family. And then this poor guy ended up committing suicide. He jumped from a building. The last prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity was the gravitational waves. Every other aspect of the theory has been tested and tested and tested and proven to be correct. Every other portion of the theory. And thanks to NASA, they tested just about every single aspect of the theory. All right, so thanks to the LIGO project, the theory has proven to be correct. And then this guy ends up winning the Nobel Prize for it. Keep the one. Same guy, he gave us the theory of time travel through wormholes. Keep the one won the Nobel Prize in physics a few years ago. All right, so as far as the three conditions are concerned, it's gonna make me time travel possible. The first one is proven. And every single aspect of Einstein's theory has been tested and proven to be correct. So what that means is time is a continuum, guys. Despite the fact that we experience reality in the present, the time is a continuum, which means that the past, the future, the present all, 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 all are happening at the same time. <laughs> We've been talking all day long. All right, so the next condition is space time continuum flat or is it curved? If it's flat, forget it. If it's curved, possibility of time travel remains alive. The last condition is the alternate timelines. Is this the only universe or are there parallel universes, parallel histories? All right, so are 